right, so I'm going to have to hide over in the corner over here. Great, so let's get started. So as we talked about last time, um, and we'll start off slow. I'm sorry that there aren't enough seats for everybody here. Um, you guys are welcome to come grab some of these chairs up here if you want. Um, like I said, this is only for today. We'll have plenty of seats from now on. Um, and yeah, you're welcome to sit on the floor too. I really appreciate your patience. And, and Mike Morrow, who needed the room swap, also really appreciates your patience. Okay, so what I'd like to start off by discussing today are some of the key elements of machine learning. So we touched on this briefly uh, last time, and I wanna go into a little bit more detail and depth um, so that we have a context in which to place a lot of the matrix math that we're going to be learning um, as, as we proceed. And so to describe this, I'd like to actually just start with some sort of example where we want to be able to predict whether a face, oops, face, um, is, let's say, masculine or feminine or smiling or um, old or young, etc. Okay, so in order to do this, we are going to start by um, getting some data and positing a model. So the key idea that underlies all of machine learning is that uh, different things that we care about can be modeled differently. So in our example, um, we know that different face types have different models. And when I talk about a model, all I mean is some sort of mathematical description of the data. Okay. So that's one of the key elements of any kind of machine learning system. Does that look blurry? It looks a little blurry. I don't know if that's any better. Okay, so then ultimately what we want to do is find some model that's going to help us determine whether a face is male or female or smiling or old or young, etc. Okay, so what do we do? So first we collect data. And this would be, for instance, photographs with faces in them. Next, we would do some sort of pre-processing. And what I mean by this is that we are going to somehow change the data that in a way that's going to let us simplify all of our subsequent tasks. And a key thing that we want to do here um, is that we want to make any changes sort of not impact our ability to do whatever learning task we have at hand. So we don't want to lose any relevant data. Uh, or in, let me say information. So in the context of our example, this would mean we could crop the images um, so that they only contain one face 
instead of many faces or center the face in the image, oops, center face, or um, resize, so all the faces in all of our images are the same size. Okay, so we might do some simple pre-processing to basically get things started. Once we do that, we need to start having a more mathematical representation of our data. We'll go back to the two screens next, next time, but thanks for your patience again. So what we're going to do is something called feature extraction. And when I talk about that, what I mean is that we are going to somehow reduce the raw data that we have, at least after the pre-processing, by extracting or taking out um, features or properties uh, relevant to the model. Okay, so for instance, if we had a human face here, then and then there was like an eye and another eye and some sort of, of nose. Okay, this is not going to be pretty. Wow, okay. All right, and then maybe some hair and some eyebrows. Okay, this is a math class, not an art class. So... We might extract things like where these different landmarks are, where the bottom eyelid is, or the top eyelid, or the outside corner, or the inside corner, or different parts of the eyebrow, or we might say the outer corners of the nose, or the tip of the nose, bottom lip, upper lip, etc. Okay, and then what they actually do for um, analyzing faces is they measure the distances between pairs of these things. So how far apart are the eyes? How close is the eye to the mouth? Or how wide is the mouth, etc. Okay, so in the context of our face problem, we would extract features like um, the distance between facial landmarks. So instead of just sticking with the raw pixel values in the image, we would actually just get this sort of summary of the information contained in the pixel values corresponding to the distances between these different landmarks. Okay, and this is how we're going to represent our data when we do learning with these, these features. Okay, and so then what we do is we would um, generate training samples. Okay, and what I mean by that is simply a large collection of examples we can use to learn the model. So, for instance, we would pre-process and extract features from many different um, images of faces. Okay, so we have extracted features and we have generated a training set of data that we can then use in order to actually get down to business and do some learning. Any questions so far? All right, so we've got some data. What are we going to do with it? So first thing we need to do is have some way of measuring how well any kind of learning scheme is working. So to learn 
a model, we have to choose a loss function. And this is just, like I said, a measure of how well a model fits data. So for instance, we might say that our loss function is the percent of samples or um, training points um, that where we where we have a misclassification whether the image is smiling or not. Okay, so we ultimately want to say classify whether images correspond to a smiling face or not. And so we want to minimize how wrong or how often we make a wrong prediction. So that would be a measure of our loss or the measure of our performance. And so then, given, given this, given sort of a, a, a general model, given some training data with features extracted and a loss function, then we finally learn the model. And that's really going to be the main focus of this class. And what I mean by it is that we, what we're going to do, either explicitly or implicitly, is we're going to do a search over a collection of candidate models or, let's say, model parameters. to find whichever one will minimize our loss. OK, so for example, if we're trying to recognize whether a face is smiling or not, we might look at the mouth width and the distance from the eye corner to the lip corner. And we might see something like this. So all the pluses corresponds to smiling, and all the minuses correspond to not smiling. OK, so when I talk about learning the model, we might say, well, I want to come up with some straight line that hopefully is going to um, separate these as well as possible. And so I might, for instance, do this. So this might be a learned model from this training data. So this would be a training sample. And this particular one was misclassified. So when we generated our training set, this was actually one of a person smiling. But this person, for whatever reason, didn't have um, a super wide mouth when they smiled. And so we would classify it as being not smiling. And so that's going to add to our loss. But for the most part, we get it right with this particular classifier. And so we've got a low, though not zero, loss. Does that make sense? Now, in the specific example that we're talking about here, where we're just trying to classify whether someone is, say, smiling or not smiling, then we would also call this the decision boundary. So something that separates positive examples from negative examples. OK, so let me show you what I mean. So this is something that I think many of you have probably seen before. Um, it is an app called FaceApp. Let's see how well I can do this. How many of you seen, have seen FaceApp before? Oh. Excellent. OK, well, this should be a lot of fun for you. So, I'm offline. 
am I offline? Yeah. Kidding me. What? Well, no, I know that that's what it says, <laughs> but, but, but I, I am online, <laughs> so I don't know why this app thinks that I'm offline. Um, just let me restart the app here. Hmm. Wow, that is a real bummer. I was looking forward to showing that to you guys. Okay. Let's just try again. Wow, that's terrible. All right, well, I'm just going to kind of keep this open. Maybe, maybe whatever's going on with the internet will improve before class is out. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit more about this. So, what page am I on? Page four. So a final step that we haven't talked about yet, but which is really important in all of machine learning, is something called generalization error. So we're on step um, six. So now what we're going to do is characterize generalization error. And generalization error, does anybody know what that is? Okay, well this is something that just tells us what is the error of our predictions on new data that was not used for training. So let me actually give you um, this same example again, but make it a little bit more complicated looking. So again, we have here mouth width. And um, the distance from the eye to the mouth, let's say, just as a shorthand. And now imagine that we have a more complicated looking oops, set of training data. So that if I were to try to find some sort of boundary that separates these things, then I could potentially get something that looks very complicated. And ultimately, what I, the whole reason that we're doing this is because later on, we want to take a new point and characterize, well, is this person smiling or not? So let's say I've got a new point here. And the question is, is that person smiling or not? Well, with this very complicated decision boundary, then I would say, no, this person's not smiling. But when we look at this data set, and I could even make it a little bit more extreme and put lots of pluses in here, then it seems like you know there's really only one, maybe two examples that suggest it might not be smiling, and a lot of stuff nearby that suggests it probably is smiling. And so this is an example of a classifier, this little, or a model, it gives us a really low loss on our training data, everything that we use to learn the model, but which gives us poor generalization performance because when I start testing this model on new data that I didn't use to generate my model, I'm going to start making lots of mistakes. And so what I want to do is I want to consider some alternatives. So one would be to say just go with a straight line like we did, and then I'm going to maybe have some more error when I, or, or loss when I look at my training data, but maybe I'll do a little bit better when it comes to this generalization error. Okay, let me just see if somehow I am online again. I even had everything preloaded. I'm so annoyed. Okay. Sorry, this was going to be a really fun example. I'll try to do it next time. 
Okay, so now let's just talk about some example models. Like, let's really get down to, to brass tacks about what we mean by all this and how we would actually do it all. So, slide five. So let's look at an example model. And this is an example that we looked at last time. So we're going to make a prediction of a label, let's say y hat, and our model says that it should look like some weight w1 times feature x1 plus some weight w2 times some feature x2. So these are weights and these are features that have been extracted from our data. And in the context of this picture that we had here, the features x1 would be like mouth width, and x2 would be the distance from your eye corner to your lip corner. And the weights, w1 and w2, essentially tell us what the slope and intercept of this line are. They define where this line is located. OK, so this model is exactly what I've been drawing a picture for. And now what we want to do is we want to become a little bit more sophisticated in how we think about this model, how we represent this model, and then how we can generalize it to solve harder, more complicated problems. So in particular, when we write this kind of weighted sum like this, it corresponds to, from linear algebra, something called an inner product. Okay, so when I talk about an inner product, I mean this. So we're going to write a vector x as just containing my features, say x1 and x2. And I'm going to have a vector w of my weights, w1 and w2. And if I think about the transpose, this is just an aside, I would write it by putting this little t up here, and it just corresponds to taking this vector and flipping it on its side, so x1, x2. And so when I talk about an inner product, what I mean, well, one way I can write that is like this. So I've got my x vector and my weight vector, and then I put it in between two angle brackets. Um, that's sort of a general way to write it, but I could also write it as this x vector transpose times my w vector. And this is absolutely the same as, in fact, what it means is x1, w1, plus x2, w2. And so when we write our model like this, our model, is that y hat is equal to this inner product between x and w. Does that make sense? Any questions? I know it's a big class, and it can feel more intimidating to ask, those, ask questions in general when it's a big class. But I guarantee you, if you've got a question, there's at least 10 other people with the same question. Don't be shy. It's much better to get questions answered now and figure out what you don't know than to figure out you don't know something on the midterm. Okay, looks like the whole Wi-Fi network is kaput here, and that's my problem. Okay, so this is our general model that we're going to work with. Um, now we could think about generalizing this. So if we have P features, and p weights, then we still can write an inner product. So we would have the inner product between x and w is simply the sum from j equals 1 to p of x, j, w, j. So it's a very simple generalization of what we were just talking about. Also, just a little bit of notation, we would write that x and w are inside the space of all vectors of real numbers of length p. So 
inside space of real valued vectors of length p. Okay, so that's just a shorthand for telling us that these vectors have p different elements to it and they're real numbers. They're not just 1 and 0, they're not just integers in this particular example, they could be any real number. Okay, so we can absolutely kind of write our model in this framework and that's going to make some other things easier and cleaner moving forward. Okay, what page am I on? Six. So in particular, now let's say that we have N training samples. So we would have a vector xi that is length p for i equals 1 to all the way to n. So that's how we could write all the features we have for all of our different um, uh, training samples. So our model then says that y hat i, the label we think that the ith training sample should have, is going to be the inner product between that particular vector's feature, or that particular sample's feature vector, and this set of weights. So if we go back to our picture, not that picture, this picture, here, so each one of these points corresponds to a different xi. So that's maybe x1, that's x2, that's x3, that's x4, etc. Right? So these are different feature vectors, or well, sorry, let me underline them. These are different samples, and each one is represented by its location in this two-dimensional space, by the mouth width and the distance from the eye to the lip. Okay? And so we've got a large number of these, each one with its own label. And we are saying that the label should somehow correspond to the inner product here between the feature vector and the weight vector. Make sense? Any questions so far? OK. So where am I? Now what we can do is combine all of these equations. So this is true for i equals 1, 2, all the way to n. So we've got n different equations of this form. So now what we can do is we can combine all these n equations. So I can say, let me form a vector y hat by just stacking together y hat 1, y hat 2, all the way down to y hat n. And then I'm going to say the following. I'm also going to write down my w vector. So I would have w1 all the way down to wp. Those are my weights. And here I'm going to have a matrix, capital X, it's going to contain all the features for all my samples. So this first row would be the feature vector for my first training sample. And I'm going to transpose it so that it's a row, and that's going to be there. And then beneath that, I have x2 transpose all the way down to xn transpose. And this is saying absolutely nothing that was, wasn't already set up here. Okay, because remember that this is the same as xi transpose times w. Right? And so all I've done is I've taken all the yi's and stacked them up, and I took all the xi transposes, and I stacked them up, and I just wrote it as one big system of equations, but I haven't really done any new modeling or any new interpretation or anything fancy. 
So I can write this as y hat vector for all my training samples as being the product of this big matrix X times my weight vector W. So W is a vector and it is of length P. X is a matrix and in this example it is length or size n by p because it's got um, n rows and p columns. And so this here is called matrix vector multiplication. So let's just step back for a second, because what we said, now I've lost, there we go. What we said was that we wanted to take a bunch of training samples, and we wanted to learn some sort of model, say some sort of line that would let us separate the positive from the negative examples. And we drew a picture like this, but it's not really clear what the best line is, or if we had millions of samples and maybe thousands of features, how we would go about calculating what the best weights were. And so what we've done now is we've taken this general intuition and written it in terms of matri um, matrices and vectors. So again, this is the same idea as we've been talking about all along. Only now we're saying we want to model all the labels as being the product of this big matrix that contains all of our features for all of our training samples and some weights W. Okay, so let's just flesh this out a little bit because I don't know how much you guys have really thought deeply about matrix vector multiplication before. And also, okay, found the clock. So we were saying that our model is y hat is equal to x times, oops, w, x times w. And computing xw means taking the inner product of each row of x with w. And then storing the results in a vector, y hat, underline. That's it. That's all we're really talking about here. Now there's a couple of things that you should note, and maybe they're obvious, but I find a lot of people forget them, and this is just a great way to do a sanity check or a gut check, or an, when it's me I call it an idiot check, <laughs> I can make sure I haven't done anything really stupid. Um, so the number of columns in X has to be equal to the length of what? So when we talk about this particular model up here, then the number of columns in X has to correspond to what? The length of W, right. Because the number of columns in X, if we, draw, if we go back to this picture here, the number of columns in X corresponds to the length of these feature vectors. So in order to take this inner product, then this vector here and this row have to have the same number of elements. And likewise, the number of rows in X has to equal the length of what? Y. Exactly right. Okay, so whenever things are going badly or don't make sense, you can always kind of go back to that and at least make sure you're not doing anything, um, setting up anything incorrectly. Okay, so let's look at an example. So 
So let's imagine that our big matrix X is 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, 0, 3. So in this case, we have two features. And we have three training samples. So the first sample is equal to 2 and 0, for instance. Or, I'm sorry, 1, one and 0. And then imagine that our weight vector is equal to 2, 4. So if we were to try to compute x times w, then the first entry is the inner product of this vector, the first row of x, and w, which in this case is what? So remember, if I were to look at, let's say, x transpose w, then that would be um, x1, w1, plus x2, w2. So if I were to look at the inner product of this first row of x and w, it would be 1 times 2 plus 0 times 4, which just gives me 2, right? And then for the second entry in this product, I would look at the inner product of 2, 0 with 2, 4. So I have 2 times 2 plus 0 times 4, or uh, just 4. And then finally, for the third entry, we have the inner product of the third row with W. So 0 times 2 plus 3 times 4, or 12. And so that's our matrix vector product. So that's one way to think about what's going on here. Um, but let me just offer you another perspective, which is this. Um, the product XW gives us a weighted sum of the columns of X. where the elements of W are the weights. Let's zoom out a little bit. Okay. So in particular, when we look at XW, we've got the first weight 2 times the first column of X. Oh, that confuses things. So times 1, 2, 0, plus the second weight 4, times the second column of x, 0, 0, 3. And so that would be 2, 4, 0, plus 0, 0, um, I'm sorry, 12, which is just 2, 4, 12, which is exactly the same as before. And so remember that each column is a, corresponds to a different feature. So for instance, this column corresponds to mouth width, and this column corresponds to the distance from your eye to the corner of your mouth. And we want to know, well, how important are these two different features for predicting whether someone is smiling? And the weight is telling us how important it is. So we assign a lot of importance to the distance from the eye to the mouth corner and a relatively small weight to how wide the mouth is. So these are telling us how we should add up these different features for all people and how important those different features are to one another. Okay, so both of these are totally equivalent ways to think about matrix vector multiplication. Um, the mechanics of it are not hard. I'm not going to have you do any homeworks even where you're just computing these things by hand. But the interpretation and the understanding of what it means, especially in sort of a machine learning context, are what are really important, what I really want you to think about. So is it kind of clear what, how all of this relates to a machine learning model? Are there any questions? OK, great. So let me give you another slightly more complicated example.
So, so far we've just been talking about things that look looks pretty linear. Here, I want to say, imagine that our model corresponds to fitting a, a polynomial to data. So let's say that y hat for the ith sample is going to equal some weight w3 times xi cubed. So in this case, p, the number of features, is equal to 1. There's just one feature, say mouth width for each person, but we think there's this kind of weird relationship that's polynomial. So plus w2 times xi squared plus w1 times xi to the 1th plus w0 times xi to the 0, which is just w0. Okay, so that's our model, that somehow there's a cubic polynomial um, relationship between this feature that we have for each sample and the label that we want to assign to that sample for, for this person. And so one thing that you might do is you might say, well, let me take a whole bunch of training samples for i equals 1 to n, take a whole bunch of examples, and try to figure out what are the values of these polynomial coefficients. And that might, on the surface, sound kind of difficult, but it turns out that it fits in exactly with everything that we've been talking about so far. So first let me just draw a little picture. So imagine that we've got some feature x and some label y hat, and we think that it should, it looks something like this, for instance. That's the relationship between x and y hat, and exactly what this curve looks like depends on these different polynomial coefficients. And we want to figure out, well, what are those polynomial coefficients? How do I describe that polynomial? So we can write this model using the same matrix vector framework that we've been talking about all along. So just like before, I form a vector y hat as y hat 1, y hat 2, all the way down to y hat n. So I get n different samples along this curve, for instance, and I want to figure out what are the parameters of that curve. And I'm going to write this, uh, I'm going to scooch it down a little bit, as a big matrix x times a weight matrix w3, or weight vector w2, w1, and w0. And in this matrix, I'm going to fill in the different um, uh, polynomials that I, that I have here. So I would have x1 cubed, x1 squared, x1, and 1. And then I'd have x2 cubed, x2 squared, x2, and 1. All the way down to xn cubed cubed, xn squared, xn one. And so I can write this polynomial model using a very simple matrix vector multiplication setup. And you can see that this matrix is some structure because if I were to take this column and just square every entry, I get the next column, etc. So this is called something called a van der Mond matrix which is helpful because, for instance, if you're working in MATLAB or want to um, just, you know, we'll, we'll come to it later, but it's helpful to know that this particular frame or, or form of a matrix is called a van der Mond matrix. Okay, so there's lots of different things you can represent with this. And what I want to do next is actually go through a demonstration of these ideas in MATLAB so you can kind of see these things in action. First, let me see if I've got, before I kind of switch over to the computer, see if I can get onto the internet here. Just a quick second. It doesn't recognize, it thinks I'm not part of the Wisconsin community for some reason. Maybe they just have different routers in this part of the building or something. I don't know. Sorry. Okay. Okay. 
So for this class, um, you can use whatever software you want. You don't have to use MATLAB, though MATLAB is freely available to anyone on campus. If you prefer to use Python or Julia, that's totally fine. I do not recommend using C or Java or anything like that because MATLAB and Python and Julia all have um, things built in that make doing things like matrix vector multiplication really fast and really simple. And if you try to just code it all directly in, say, C, you, you will not be happy. Uh, so whichever one you want to use is totally fine with me. I am most familiar with MATLAB, and so if you get stuck with some code, I might be able to help you with MATLAB. The chances are much lower with other languages. And just in terms of like small debugging things, big picture stuff, it'll be no problem. Um, and I'm going to probably do most of the demos in MATLAB as well. OK. And I think the book also uses MATLAB for all of its demos. OK, so first I've got, oh, oh, and I will post this on Canvas, the script that we're looking at here. So you don't have to try to hurriedly copy it all down. So in this first example, I'm going to imagine that I've got 500 different training samples and two features for each one. So you could think about this as like our mouth and face um, setup here. And I am going to form this matrix. Just, I'm just going to form a random matrix for this little toy example. So this is saying use random numbers that are uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. It's not super important. But I'm going to have n different rows and p different columns, just like we've been talking about this, the last hour. And then I'm also going to form a vector of weights. So it's going to have p different rows and one column, just like we've been talking about. I'm going to generate them at random, but then that's between 0 and 1. So I'm going to allow some of them to be negative by subtracting off 1 half, and then multiply and round it by something, just so I've got some nice integers here for you guys to look at. And so if I want to do this matrix vector multiplication in MATLAB, it is as simple as just writing x times w. And that is going to do exactly the kind of matrix vector multiplication that we've just been talking about. And it's going to do it automatically. And what I'm going to show you is what happens when I do this. So I generate a random x matrix and a random or, or feature matrix, let's say, and a random set of weights. And then I am just going to plot it in 2D. OK, so this is analogous, totally analogous, to what we were doing with our little faces example. So I've got one set of features here and another set of features here. My weights, W1, were negative 11, and W2, negative 5, or positive 5. And the color assigned to each dot corresponds to the value of Y hat that's coming out of this model. So if I wanted to classify points, for instance, I could say, well, I'm going to give stuff a, a, a negative label if y hat is greater than negative 2 and a positive label otherwise, or something like that. But you can see how this model is assigning some sort of numerical label to each one of the different points. Um, and it is maybe hard to see, but it's nice and linear. In fact, we can see it a little bit better if we make n a lot, lot bigger. So here I'm just using um, the scatter plot function. And I'm saying the horizontal axis is the first column of x. And in fact, sorry, let me just back up for a second here. Let's start by having n be 5. It doesn't make the plot very interesting. But I can show you now, if I go into the command line, I can just type x, and it's showing me this matrix. So it is showing me, remember, each row corresponds to a different sample. And each column is corresponding to a different feature. OK, so all of that is in x. And then there are things I can do with x. So for instance, if I do x uh, 2 comma 1, then that's going to say, let me look at the second row and the first column. So it should output 0.5. And in fact, it does output 1.5. So I can find different elements of this matrix. I could also do something like colon comma 1. And that says I want all of the different columns and the, or I'm sorry, all the different rows and the first column. 
And so, in fact, I do get the first column of x here. And likewise, if I do that, I get the second column. Or I could say x 1 comma colon, which says, give me all the entries in the first row, which is this. So that would be the feature vector associated with the first, say, sample. So when we go over here, then what I'm doing is I am doing a scatter plot where the first feature corresponds to the first column, and the second feature corresponds to the second column, and I'm making them each each little dot have 40 pixels. It's not super important, but I'm then making the color correspond to how big y hat is, and then just plotting that. Okay, so here now I've generated again, but with lots more data points, and you can kind of see how it's. It's nice linear. So if I just look at one particular color, it follows a nice linear line diagonally across this. And every time I run this, I use a different, I get a different whoops, set of weights. And that changes how the color or how the labels appear across the different samples. <coughs> Does this make sense? Any questions? Okay, let me show you another example then. And this has to do with our little cubic polynomial. So now what I'm doing is I am um, generating a whole bunch of different values of little x, because remember in this case we had a single feature for each point, just some number between plus and minus one for instance, and I'm generating n of them. And here I'm just saying, let's, let's just make them evenly spaced between minus 1 and plus 1, and we're going to have n different samples. And then I form this Vandermond matrix. Whoops. So in particular, let's again, let's consider this with a really small n for a second. Let's say 5. And let's actually look at what this is doing. So x now is this vector of five different numbers between plus and minus one. And now if I were to form this Vandermond matrix, then what it's doing is, there we go. I've got this column of ones, just like I wrote in the notes. Then I've got that vector of, of x values. Then I've got all of those values squared and all of those values cubed. Okay, so it's exactly like what we were talking about on paper. And you can see that when we talk about doing this in MATLAB, it's just super easy to form that matrix. Okay, so now we're going to actually do this with many more than five um, samples. And so now I've got P different weight, or, or four in this case, different weights that I need. One for x cubed, one for x squared, one for x, and one for the constant offset. So I'm just going to choose those at random and generate my um, predicted labels, my y hats. And then I'm going to plot that. And that shouldn't be there. And so here's one example of a curve that is represented with this matrix vector multiplication. So we've got all these different values of x's and all the values of y hat. And so even though I'm working with a, non, a polynomial, a cubic polynomial, I can represent it very easily with these sort of matrix vector ideas. And every time I run it, I just choose a different set of polynomial coefficients and I get a different curve, but they're all represented within this same general framework. Okay. That wraps up more or less what I wanted to do, except let me just try, since we've got a few minutes left, to get this, get on the internet. There's something wrong with the Wi-Fi. It was like even when I first turned this on, it was sort of flashing up there for a long time. So I don't think it's my phone. So just hang tight for a minute while it tries to get online. And if not, we'll just try again on Wednesday. For those of you who maybe stepped in a few minutes late, um, I proposed that we have the midterms on, on October 11th and November 15th. And I asked if there were any big conflicts that people had, you know, like a big class where lots of people have a conflict. 
I'm not seeing any reactions, though, so I will get that posted and set up. All right, success. All right. So here we go. So let's say we have learned a model for what different faces, how they're different, how they're characterized. And then we want to use this to make predictions. So in my little example here, I load up a photo. Will this folk? Oh. Uh, all right, there we go. And now what I could do is I could say, well, what would this photo look like if he were smiling? And what it's doing here is it is taking information about what is characteristic of a smiling face, such as the width of the mouth or the distance from the mouth corners to the eyes, and altering those features to kind of move. If, I mean, if we think about my picture. Here we go. We had this picture here. So we've got a point here that's not smiling. And we say, well, how much should we alter the different features to move it over on this side so that it looks like it's smiling? And so you could do that. Or here's another example. We could see what he might, uh, it's too out of focus. But you can see what he would look like if he was older. So it adds some wrinkles and it adds some gray hair. Or you could say, what if he was a little bit more feminine looking? <laughs> Or what if he were goateed? Or what if he were much, much younger?